Hello, and welcome to The Skating Lesson. I'm Dave Lees. And I'm Jonathan Beyer. I don't have an Olympic silver medal, do you, Dave? <laughs> yes, today we're thrilled to welcome back one of our favorite guests, Yelena Bechke. Yelena, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. It's always awesome. Yes, so what is it like? I, everyone wants to know, you're watching your coach still have so much success this season. She's still at the Olympic Games. She's been in every documentary before the Olympics. What, you know, what has this experience been like for you? Okay, well, of course, I wanted my coach to be one and two, without a doubt. I wanted her peers to be one and two. But as she said the other day, everybody wants that. I'll tell you, though, when I woke up on Saturday morning and I knew skating was live, I couldn't get myself to watch last warm up. And I was like, okay, I'm going to wait for the results and then I will watch. But then I said, no, stop it. Have some coffee, turn it on, and just have the nerve to watch. So I did. And, you know, I feel a little bit upset that she didn't play second and third or even first, second, you know, the, the best scores possible. But as she said, again, it is what it is. And basically, she made a very good point with saying, you compete as you practice. So I think for her and for um, Nastya and not. I don't ever remember their names, but anyways, for the second, for the third place team, I think it was a great success. They're young, they're beautiful, they're fresh. And I think they expected to be first in the way it looked like when they skated clean, they thought it's done, congratulations, we're, we're first. But then even the boy said, hey, 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 hold on a second, let's wait. And I think that's when I started thinking maybe they're not gonna be first or second because you never know, you gotta wait till the end. And when everything uh, finished, I was a little bit bitter because of course I wanted my coach to be the best. I know she's retiring most likely. And of course it's always best to retire when you're at high point. But I think overall she should be very happy and satisfied with the way her skaters behaved to begin with and the way they competed because it was a long time to be away from home, from your parents, from your friends. And I think the behavior was awesome no meltdowns, no screaming and no nothing upsetting. So, you know, I think in a way it was a huge success for her. Mm. Mm. Do you know if she's retiring for sure? Do you think that she'll coach them part-time, oversee, make her she will. She will consult. She will consult, she will be there, but I think she's gonna put more and more responsibilities on her co-coach. <laughs> and I think in a way she probably will hire someone to actually help them as a team because I think for her she's 80 she's probably tired of traveling it's not that easy you know I have my mom who's 85 and she's living with me and she for her it's an ordeal to go grocery shopping so for someone of that age and after all these years of crazy experiences ups and downs and upsets and success it must be difficult you know plus she has a life to live and she has grandchildren and children though they're grown but still I think it's the best way for her to just enjoy the, the life that she has. Mm -hmm. Now that Igor is gone, it's completely different for her. And, you know, probably a lot of thinking to do, but I think in a way she will consult and help other skaters to become successful because her skating school, her pair skating school is still there in St. Petersburg and more skaters will probably come and she will help them out. Mm -hmm. Maybe just not with her skates on 24 seven doing sit spins and axles. Hopefully, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You but maybe, from but maybe, that. yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Yeah. For her, do you think that um, third place, do you think it's upsetting or do you think it's just more experience and perspective for her at this point? For Tamara, I think it was a little bit unexpected. And to me, it looked like she was absolutely sure they were going to be at least second. Mm -hmm. But from my perspective, as much as I love everybody, I mean, I am shocked with how wonderful the competition turned out to be. What I see, I think Mission and Galamov could be a little bit stronger at the end, just like that final 45 seconds of the routine, if they had more power, I think this will help them to score higher with components. Because technical score, I mean, what could be done better? There's only one right. yellow box, I think, but the rest was just, as wonderful as they were, I think speed and power would help them to be second. And then of course, Mar Tarasov and Morozov got out there and they were amazing. And again, the technical score was perfect. There was nothing really to improve. She fought for everything and they were gorgeous and 
unexpectedly amazing because everybody's so used to them not holding together the loan program. And they were more powerful at the end, I think. And of course, when Chinese got out there, last minute of that routine was with the champions because the power, the speed, the look at us, we leave it, we love it. There was the throw jump and then two leaps at the end, I think basically sealed the deal for them to win. That's, that's just my opinion. You know, they had nothing to lose at that point and they knew they were doing really well. And that's what I think. I think Tamara probably could see it as well. And what are you gonna do when your skaters finished? You just sit there and you watch the rest and think, hmm, everything was amazing. Maybe a lack of power. And I know they talked about this before. It's not the first time even I thought that. It's a great program. It's beautiful. It's just amazing in every, every aspect of it. But just lack of, <clears throat> you know, that final 30 seconds when everybody's waiting for that triumph at the end. And I think that's what did it. Mm. Yeah, maybe I'm wrong. It's, but it's interesting. It's interesting because I think at some point in every great Olympic moment, you see the point in the program when they loosen up. Like we saw yeah. it with Nathan Chen after a certain yeah. jumps, like all of a sudden the weight yeah. is lifted and they can enjoy and sell the program a little bit yes. more. And that's what I was yeah. sort of waiting for, for Mishina <laughs> Galiyama, and they didn't do it. And yeah. I couldn't help but wonder if they had mm -hmm. one scary element left because it was that oh, final yeah. lift, of course, they went down oh. on in the team event. So I didn't know they couldn't really let loose any moat yet because they were nervous mm -hmm. about getting through that. How do you think Tamara would have handled that with them in sort of trying well, to get that, that was, mental that was, block away? That was a fluke. Usually yeah. they don't fall on that. So right. I think that mentally strong enough to just say, okay, this was one time. We're not going to let this happen again. But in the back of your mind, it's always there. You know, I've been there. I've done that. It takes one time to kind of shake your confidence but i'm mm. pretty sure tamara probably made them do it multiple times in run throughs prior to the event and talk to them about it and i'm pretty sure they're mature enough and strong enough to overcome that issue however i think from my perspective the crossovers and the actual approach into that lift could have been done a little bit stronger i don't think it's actually the lift and the fear mm. of missing it or messing it up i think it's just that final transition that they had that needed that little bit more of like a grasp for that power last final crossovers going into the league that's just you know my opinion because you know I lived that life I know exactly what it takes to be spectacular at the very end either you skate well or not you got to give it all it's the last 20 40 seconds of proving that okay I still got it and I think it's just the way it was choreographed that last specific corner when they go around the corner and they do crossovers that just needed go for it you know like mm -hmm. stroking class kind of go for it i okay. think but i think mental block was lifted i don't think they doubted each other or themselves or even each other because that fall that happened was both of their faults in my opinion i think she dropped heavily and he was not prepared because you never prepared for things like this but i think it takes two to tango and i think once she dropped a little bit lower than expected he couldn't handle it because he had no clue it was coming which means, you know, in Paris skating or any event, you stay, have to stay alert until it's done. You take your bow, you're off the ice, then you can completely relax and let go. Yeah. But that's, again, that's just my opinion on the matter. I do think you're right about that last, not bringing it home with the emotion and the power. Um, the one thing I noticed, uh, a couple things. Tamara is forever going to be famous now for the term little details uh, when yeah. she was in the documentary talking about Anton's double axel. I did yeah. think in the very beginning of the program, the one thing is that I think everyone knew that Mishna Galyamov had potentially the mm -hmm. highest technical yeah. base coming into this. I do yeah. think um, Anastasia's Euler has yeah. looked scary, at, you know, throughout the season, although it was actually yeah. not as scary uh, in the finale. Yeah. But I think the throw, uh, the first throw that they did, the landing was Alcohol. not their usual. Exactly. And I think, yeah. you know, all of the top three were within a point and a half of each other in that, in the, for the mm -hmm. free state, it was almost a tie, so it could be anything. But I want your yeah. perspective on the creativity of Tamara Maspina. So she has planned this great ending for the team to go yeah. up. It sounds like old Soviet music. And it just seems a little bit unnatural for this team that they miss the ending. What is your perspective on, should they have changed it? Was it, you know, on the ending of their program? Does it kind of miss, is it missing the ta-da that we're 
expecting. So, yeah, because sometimes it feels like it felt like through the season that they had to wait almost for perfect timing. But also, yeah. Tamara, she likes those exclamation marks. She loves it. But those only work when they're done exactly when they need to be done. If you wait five, six, seven, eight up, it loses its expression. I mean, impression because uh, we're waiting for something and it just didn't happen. Oh, wait, 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 it happened. Mm. But it might not be the kid's fault because, you know, sometimes you run early. And if you have an element like this at the end, you really have to be right on that specific boom to make it look perfect. I think the idea is there. Of course, it's a triumph. It's this is it. We are not, well, like that's, last year they did were the champions, right? It's not the same routine. It was dedicated to a famous Russian composer and very popular music in Russia. I grew up with all that. I skated to the first part. Many skaters, pair skaters, skated to that very specific first part because it's such a traditional, heartbreaking, in a way, piece of music that moved me, inspired me and Dennis and myself to skate to it. But see, we used the whole piece. It was four and a half of that music but in professional field you do 45 minutes that seconds adagio leave and then you do 30 seconds of something else it's easier with them they had to use that fast part which was mm. a great idea for people of from my generation because we know exactly what it represents the rest of the world has no clue so it had to be so musically choreographed that that last boom has to be that last boom and i think in a way it's just waiting for that last boom kind of changed the outcome a tiny bit but like i said the idea was phenomenal tamara we skated with um first pieces of music as amateurs and professionals when we were right on the boom or sometimes you really had to chase after the boom or sometimes you're like okay boom boom <laughs> you know <laughs> so we've done it Dennis and I. so i know how it feels it feels awkward to sit there and wait but you know you have to hit it right. so and like I said, idea, the idea was great. Typical, mm -hmm. typical my coach's idea. We're going to do whatever it takes. And even at the end, we're going to put that giant exclamation mark on that last note of successful routine. So that was the concept. What's your take on the music in general here? When you bring up music, I found that the skating was excellent yesterday. Mm -hmm. I thought it was some of the best of the Olympics. But every single piece of music was so sad that I felt, I felt like we have got to get rid of this downer music that everyone is yes. using. Yeah. Well, I agree with you completely. And I listened to some Russian podcasts from some people who know everything, of course, the specialists and people who have the guts to criticize everyone without them being anyone or anything. But anyways, the strong point was, yes, last multiple pair teams had lyrical, like, sad and beautiful that meant something to them great wonderful but the excitement of wow let's do something fast and strong and powerful wasn't there and as a matter of fact mission and galama i think they had the most of it because at least the music changed to stronger and more powerful if only they could skate it out at the end but um as for music i loved everyone don't get me wrong everybody was amazing I have to say that the Chinese couple who won the event, I think their choice of music was probably the best out of all slow parts because you cannot go wrong with that music. It's such mm. a meaningful piece of music. I remember Chris Yamaguchi skating to it and starts on nice. I was there drooling over that program every night watching her because it just touches your heart. It's such a meaningful song that says so many things about life and friends and people and love and everything. I don't think you can go wrong with that, though it's used and overused and abused, you know, everybody has to skate to it. But I think it was the best choice of music. Everyone could understand it. I knew it. And I didn't have to think, sit there and think, what is the lyric? What are they trying to sing? Because sometimes I cannot understand the words. So to me, okay, well, that's beautiful. That's wonderful. Well, Ava Maria, everybody knows that. Hallelujah, everybody knows that. And it's too famous not to know some words. But the bridge over troubled water, I can sing it probably. And in my opinion, it was probably the best choice of music with development towards the end with the strongest part, because that piece of music has slow and stronger, slow and extra strong. So that's why I think, as I agree with you on, there was nothing that 
crazy like Nathan Chen, for example, he was outstanding. He stood out of the crowd because his music was wow, very energetic. In pairs, we lack that. But of course, you know, in pairs, it's difficult probably to skate something a bit like that when you have to think triple, 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 double, double, quadruple this and triple that. It's, it's hard. That's why I think most of the pair teams choose music that they can actually skate their best. And I think, as you mentioned it, maybe next Olympic cycle, actually people will start making changes and see, okay, we need to put some energy into this specific event because pair skating is becoming a sad miniature version of dance, you know, because dance, mm -hmm. of course, however, dance have more of a change of rhythm. Pairs, they keep to the same kind of slow, nice pace. That's, and I think that's because they feel like they can skate it out a lot more and be more expressive and basically tell us your story because that's what it's all about these days. If there's a script, you give it to people and they sit there and then, oh, this is what it is. You know, I hear this multiple times, even when I go to local competitions myself, judges over and over repeat this, the same thing. Shh, tell us your story. And when you teach a seven-year-old, sometimes you cannot do that because they just don't know what story to tell. And you can right. tell them, okay, you're Cinderella. Okay, well, I'm Cinderella. And they're bored. Or they want to do certain piece of music. You know, they cannot tell the story because they're not mature enough. So, but I think overall, next Olympic cycle, I have a strong feeling that we're going to move towards, come on, younger generation, do something powerful, do something different, do something like, no one done before. Like Nathan Chen and his Elton John routine. It's like, whoa, what was that? Because it's so different. And I think that's what everybody's ready for. A little bit of a change of pace. Mm. And next four years, perfect opportunity. We all have younger kids coming up. I think there are going to be huge changes in who's going to stay, who's going to go, who's going to compete, who's going to quit. That's normal after four years of Olympics. Mm. But I cannot agree with you more about sadness <laughs> you know? do you have a kind of music that you like to skate to i'm just curious because i find this year you know i'm skating to something very powerful last year i skated to something more lyrical i find it easier to do the elements with the powerful music in practice to get myself up to execute right but you have to be technically equipped and yes. your stamina has to be up to beat to be able to do it and level of stress when you have to skate to something upbeat is a lot higher you know, I agree with you, but not for some. Some skaters have, they, they're timid to more powerful music because they feel like they're pushed too hard and they are rushing themselves. But I think with practice and correct choices of powerful music, because you don't have to go 100 miles an hour, you can just change the pace a little bit, little by little, and see how you feel. And, you know, work on your stamina, work on your technical content, do what you can, do the best way you can, instead of basically setting up an attainable goal and feeling like this music is too fast for me. Been there, done that. We had one year, Dennis and I, when we failed grandly, 1990, 91, right before the Olympic year, when we skated to this Turkish music. And I still have nightmares about that music because it was so too fast for us. We didn't feel it. And every competition was a disaster for me because I knew I couldn't skate up to that music. It was not me. Mm. So when we chose Nutcracker for the Olympic year, Tamara fought us to the end. She said, basically, uh-uh. If you want to use this music, you're on your own. Find someone else, do the choreography. And we did. And it ended up a hit, you know, because if we use something, what she suggested, it was French music, you know, this, this, and that. Flirty. I'm sure the success would not be the same because we initially rejected the idea. But mm. I agree with you completely. And... Um, Changing the pace and going from zero to 100 will take a little bit of a take your time and see how you feel, gradual approach. You know, I'll give you an example. Uh, Jason Brown, the biggest hit that I've had with him and I still love to watch over and over with his, what's his iron, um, Irish dance. River That's dance, like, yeah. River dance, yeah. This will go in history. This, this cannot be done any better. And I still remember, not that I compare his routines to that, but I know it was his best ever powerful performance or for that matter alexi yagudin 2002 short program wow power energy of that routine and you know of course he had more other ones but i think that was like 
incredible amount of power and energy coming out of that, which made people think, wow, this was something new, something never been done before. And I think that's what has to take place in the next couple of years to, for athletes in general, not just doctors, change the pace a little bit. And yes, the demand is incredible. And that's a lot easier to do. Start your routine, pair skating. I'm talking about pair skating. Do your triple salka, something, then skate around, catch your breath, do this, do a triple, double, double, <laughs> and then you move on to your you, you throws, and then you move on to the rest. And that's, I think, a lot of period teams do that. But the ones with saving strong elements for the end succeed stronger like Chinese. I mean, that throw jump at the very end was, wow, that was it. That was part of their success plus those leaps that they did. So, I mean, we will see what happens. I really hope for more energy from a lot of skaters, you know, from new generation coming out, hopefully. But speaking of energy, I'm intrigued as you talked about like who will retire and who will sort of stay in competitive sport right now. I'm intrigued the world championships after an Olympics must be so difficult, especially for these. I think even though Boykova had some issues, I think the four top teams actually gave really, really fine performances here. Yeah. So I'm intrigued. Do you do you have any thoughts on who may want to go to a world and who may not and why? Like how that must be to, to balance mm -hmm. that time in between? Well, okay, from my experience, the time in between was horrible. We got I second bet. place at the Olympics, we came home. It's nonstop distractions. Today is channel whatever. Next day station this, and next day is this, and that's friends, there's family. There's, you have to get together with these people. It's like your training is disrupted. It's never the same as it's before the Olympics. It's just not. And you're tired. And you still yeah. have to find the strength, mental and physical, to continue with the training. And I can tell you for sure, Dennis and I tried the best. But when we got to the world championships, I was a mess. Of course, I wanted to win. Of course, you know, I uh, didn't get cheated at the Olympics. I, I was super happy with second place. But deep inside, I was like, okay, this is my time. And I got myself killed just thinking about it. So mm -hmm. for, as, I don't know about the single skaters, but for peers, my perspective is, I think everybody's going to go, maybe not Tarasov and Marozov, because these guys were phenomenal and it's hard for them to do it again. You know, they're not as young as other skaters. It's once in a lifetime, you want to stop it right there. And they seemed super happy with silver medal. I was, I cried. I was happy for them because I know how tough it is. They are older and they still look the best. Well, I mean, of course, Chinese were great, but as for Russians, they looked amazing. They looked like they were young and fresh and mature and, you know, they expressed their feelings for each other. The chemistry was there. It was amazing. Of course, I think Tamaric pair teams will go because Mishina and Galamov are young and they can do it again and again and again. And I think Boykova and Kozlovsky definitely will want to go and figure out, okay, what's going on here? Because honestly, I think they were the only couple who were very disappointed because you can tell, and he said at press, well, there was not a press conference for that, but interview. He clearly said, I don't understand. And when I was watching, and maybe I don't know all the rules these days, but for me to see five or six yellow boxes on perfectly executed elements, what am I missing? And he said that basically they disappointed because not the way they skated. Yes, the throw loop was a mess. And she, poor thing, she saved that she didn't fall on her face. But to me, they looked phenomenal. I didn't think they were much worse than uh, Mishin and Galamov. I think they actually had more power at some point. They looked awesome. I love them. But um, those yellow boxes, it's like the cheap pieces of the block. Boom, boom, boom. Like almost on purpose. What were they mm -hmm. looking for? What do I not see? Because I found pair skating my a huge chunk of my life. And maybe I, IGS is not my strongest thing at these days because I don't teach pairs. But I still recognize skills. I still recognize throw was good. This was good. This was good. Where? What are they looking for? And then, of course, you start thinking lift. Maybe they didn't rotate enough in the position. Maybe she didn't hit this position fast enough. Maybe she dropped her leg early. So who knows? And what he said about it, he said that, well, all we can do, wait for the protocol, sit down with the coaches and talk about it. And he, they didn't sound bitter, but of course they are stressed and upset about it because to me, even short program, I don't understand why they got scored 
well, there was a little bit of a mistake. Yes, get it. But still, it was really boom. They just got so many points chopped off. So I think they were slightly disappointed because they're still pretty good. They're amazing. Of course, you cannot make mistakes when you go to the Olympics if you want to be top three. You can't. But, you know, Chinese made a mistake and they still won. And, you know, I thought about it. It's just that off the subject, I, my first reaction was like, how? She messed up triple cell count. And I watched Peacock without commentating. So that quadruples twist, I didn't even catch it was a quad. Mm. I was like, okay, why did they get 10 points? How come Russians with amazing execution got seven points? What? So I went back and then finally it hit me. It was a quad. That's why they gained, they gained points. And mm. even if she messed up the talk out, it was not enough for them to lose because that the quad gave them such an advantage. So then I was like, okay, well, no doubt, no question about it. Because yes, she made a mistake, but the rest was basically perfect. It's really nothing to pick on. So that's just a little bit off the subject. That's because I didn't understand why they won. But then when I went back and looked at it, I realized, ah, I see now, because they risked to put the difficult element in and it worked for them in a way. But it, and the interesting thing is when I did look at the judges sheets afterwards, mm -hmm. it, it's clear no one knew what to do with these yeah. top pairs. Like there were yeah. one, two, yeah. three, four judges had the Chinese in third yeah. after the yeah, free I know. And then some people didn't know, wow. do they, some people had Tarasova Morozov first, some people had Mishina yeah. Galiamov first. Yeah. Like, so it was nice actually that there were three, and in my opinion, partially four, mm -hmm. like really strong contenders for the podium here. Um, but you could oh, see yeah. no one, it, nothing yeah. was decisive. Everyone was sort of shuffled around. Well, it was not, it was not a clear first, 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 second, 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 but it's good. That's what makes the sport so exciting because people have opinions and mm -hmm. I like this couple better. Judges are judges. They're still people and they have the right to say, well, this style I love, this style I don't love. And it's very normal. That's actually, it's a great thing that that shows you that there was no political involvement whatsoever. The judges were divided. And mm. because at first people started saying, well, you know, obviously no one wants Russian to win. It's just um, people are tired of Russians. But that's not it. It's not right. it. Even if you look back at 2018, it was Germans, Chinese, you know, it was not about killing Russians. It right. was about judges. They, they look at skaters, they don't think, Russia, China, whatever, Ukraine, this, this, and the other. They look at the, at least they try to separate political thing from actual athletic thing, because that's the only fair way to do it. And I think it's really good that the, the marks were not one, two, and three. So mm. there were options, there were decisions. And no one can say, oh, it was all political because this judge did this and that judge did that, because you, you cannot really say it. You know, it's very normal. It's a process. And as Tamara always said, if you want to be first or whatever, second and third, you have to be two heads above. Then no mm. one can pick on you and say, nah, nah, I like that better. And, you know, it's difficult to be like that, but it's doable. A lot of, if you remember Gordiev and Grinkov, they were like out there. They were so untouchable that it was easy for them to win. And I mean, plenty of examples when skaters get out there. Nathan Chen, for example, he's so ahead of everyone that what are you going to do? You cannot really give them third or fourth place. That would be ridiculous. You will be laughed at because this guy is clearly the best in the world. And his skating, his behavior, his attitude, his work ethics, he's all that, you know? And I think also judges watch practices and it tells them a story. You know, you don't want to sit there and watch fall off the fall off the fall off the fall and all of a sudden oh they pulled it together at competition that gives you perfect uh, explanation for 1994 olympics when gordiva Grinkov versus mishkutionik and dmitriev when first black place was so perfect in practice and mishkutionik and Dmitriev struggled and then judges were like um they were not ready because they expected a disaster out of their skate you know which i think still not fair it should be you skate you get it you make mistakes, you get it, you know, but judges are people and they come and they want to be, they come to practices, they sit and watch and 
You want to be relaxed. You want to watch something that is reliable, consistent, outstanding, beautiful, confident. You know, it's just the way it is. You're at that level of figure skating. They expect that. You know, yeah, one I, thing I when you go to a club of think, a local club competition, it's different than the children. You know, but we're talking about mature athletes who'd spend their lives doing this, you know. I think for me, when I was watching and trying to rationalize who is going to be first, and mm -hmm. I was just thinking that when you talk about Gordy even Grinkoff, you talk about Berish Nyan, Sigurlitsa, yes. the ice dance, you talk about the French, there's a certain yeah. glide of the eye that some of them have in terms of their skating skills and their chemistry mm -hmm. with each yep. other. And I think that the Chinese have that. I think it's actually like Berish Nyan, Sigurlitsa, it's stronger than their actual, maybe technical elements, but their overall yep. skating and projection mm -hmm. just really kind of carry the day. And I think it makes the judges kind of more willing to overlook little details. As Tamara would say, yeah. That yeah. the sow cow for uh, Sway, I thought was obviously a big error, uh, but it was very, made it very close. You know, I think the judges, I do think them being second four years ago and being so strong, I think that yeah. there has yeah. to be some sort of an advantage. And I do mm -hmm. think with Mishnah Galyamov thinking about them and talking to people in Paris, I think there was a feeling after Worlds last year when they won that many mm -hmm. people were upset that the Chinese pair didn't win. And they thought that maybe Michel Gayamov didn't yet have that extra refinement that comes with time. So I think for yeah. next year, you know, I think, I do think that their program this year, like had to mature them and they had to skate up to it. And last year's program, I think maybe was emotionally easier. Yeah. Well, yes. And as they grow, if they continue, which I really hope they continue in the sport, because they still, for pair skating, they're babies. They have mm -hmm. at least four more years to improve and, be successful. And as Tamara always says, stay in the sport, get your gold medal, get your highest accomplishment because it will help you with your professional career. Well, yeah, they're world champions, get it, wonderful, national champions, the Olympic bronze medalist, you know, and who knows what's gonna happen with the team event, but still they can stay in the sport for four more years and improve so much and become gold medalists in four years. Yeah, of course they're gonna be younger generation, but they will have experience, you know, under the belt because younger generation still need to learn. Whoa, that's what it feels like. I, I'm not. I'm not sure what I'm doing here. I'm scared to death. And these guys will have an advantage of been there, done that. And same goes for Boykov and Kozlovsky. I think they still so young and have so much to offer to the world, the figure skating. But I tell you, when Dennis and I we started skating together late, and we missed the first Olympics, of course, because there was no way 19. 88 was a possibility. We just started skating together. So staying in the sport for four years and dealing with massive ups and downs. Oh, looking back at it now, how did I make it? Mm. How, how did I stay sane? How did I manage all those tears, all those, I quit. I cannot do this anymore. Not out loud in front of the world, but you know, in my at my rink in my locker room at my parents' house, where I would come home and just go, oh, I don't get it. I train, I practice, and I still cannot do it. You know, it's tough. It's tough for four years to have that distant goal. But in Russia, this is how it's done. You have a plan for four years. Of course, goal number one is Olympics, and then you take year by year by year by year. And Tamara is awesome with planning. So you set up goals for each year and you take one year at a time. So there's no such <clears throat> four years. And that's what helps you to actually stay sane and you know accomplish your goals with easier approach without losing your mind along the way. So I don't know how it's done in the United States, but in Russia, it's planning is everything and planning is mandatory. So we used to plan everything like the season is over and you get this paperwork you have to sit down with your coaches and write things down. This is what I plan. This is competitions they'll give me. I have to attend. I have to place this, this, and that. I have to do this, this, and that. And it was really, if you don't follow your plan, eh, there were trouble, you know, because you have to plan um, up attainable goals and go with it. And I think that's with Tamara's help, I think her two pair teams, and I think she has younger pair teams in her group right now. I think with all this, it's going to be great for them as long as they stay with her, trust her and Arthur Minchok and whomever Tamara hires to work with the kids. 
this is just from my perspective, my advice, stay with Tamara. Because at some point, Dennis, not, not so much Dennis and I, my first partner, and I thought, oh, you know, maybe we should work with someone else. This would have been the biggest mistake ever because, you know, back in the day, you don't think, you don't know about that, that your coach is a gift to you. So, of course, now when I'm my age and I look back at my career, I know she was a gift to us. And I love her more today than I loved her back then. She is my mentor. She is my friend. I mean, I love her so much like my mother. And I wish mm. in the way she was my mother because I would just hug her and, you know, hold her like this all the time because she's so tiny and so smart and so fun and so funny. She was like a perfect creature, perfect person. There's nothing negative to say about her. She's very smart, intelligent, realistic. She will never say anything silly or unintelligent. It's like the person is perfect in my, in my eyes, in my opinion, in my heart. That's all I have to say about her. She's a gift. And I know that you both had some, some tough conversations after 92, right? About do you stay in for 94? Right. Do you not mm -hmm. stay in for 94? Which brings me like to something like the Canadian pair of v Vanessa James and Eric Radford. Yeah. You know, they had success yeah. at the previous Olympics with their other partners. I, I yeah. wonder yes. where was the maybe the Tamara-like figure to say, are you sure you want to do this? Because I, when you see two mm -hmm. athletes that have had such success in the past, it's tough to watch them struggle in this mm -hmm. way. Not be so successful, yeah. Well, but what yeah. do you expect? They just got together. They were, they were great pair skaters without each other, but it takes years. Dennis and I were great pair skaters before we got together. And it took us at least two years to actually feel that way in sync. As perfect mm. as we were, we paired, we were perfect together. Our timing and everything was just ideal, but it still takes time. And if Tamara was to give the, her advice to these two guys, people who decided to skate together, I'm sure she would sit down with them and say, are you sure? Write down why, yes or no, why are you doing this? Because mm. the outcome of this could be very positive or could be disastrous. And what are you trying to accomplish? You're not young, you on a field, in the field of all those younger skaters, as beautiful as Vanessa is, oh my gosh, it's like a perfect skater. It's still hard to keep up with younger generation. I mean, younger generation, they're just naturally younger. You know, they're like yeah. younger athletes, younger sprinters, stairs in the marathon runners. You cannot fight that. It's just normal. Mm. You're younger, you know? And with us, Tamara's argument with us not to continue into 1994 was very reasonable, which upset me to no end when we had this discussion. She said, why are you staying for next Olympics? Well, because I can learn my triple toe. I can work on my triple salka. I can do this, this, and then. And she said, okay, well, let's speak. Let's talk. Gordieva Grinko for coming back. Do you think you're going to beat them? Nope. Mm -mm. Didn't happen before. Will not probably happen. It's just they're so beautiful and so well known, and they can do double axles, and they're going to be still ahead of everybody. Nishkutonik and Dmitry, super strong, super strong. Are you going to beat them? Possible. Brazor and Ice are coming back, super hungry. They want to win, and they improved. When I watched them, 1994, they were different skaters. Confident, happy, upbeat. Exactly what we talked about. Lots of energy, different kind of routines, and it still didn't take to be first mm. or second. They still ended up third. So Tamara's point was like, why are you going to come back? The risk to get first place, I mean, the chance to get first place is zero. Let's be honest. Okay, yes. Second, possible, yes. Why? You're going to waste, well, not waste, but spend four years of your athletic career killing yourself eight hours a day, skating and training and falling. Injuries, who knows, possible. You know, you can get upset with a sport and quit. Not, I mean, why? You're wasting your time. Go professional. And that was the best decision she's ever made for us. As much as I cried overnight and told her, like, you know what? That's it. I'm upset. We're not friends anymore. This and that and the other. She did the right thing. She's mm. wise. And that's why she advised us. At the same time, Mishko Tionek and Dmitry, if she advised, yes. And between two, two peers, Elaine and Dennis and Natalia and Arthur, she chose them. Me understanding that, I couldn't understand that. But then again, when I thought about it, Natalia was more reliable. 
Arthur was always a rock. He was always, do you think? He always lands everything. Natalia was more reliable psychologically. So for Tamara to work with them and expecting higher success was more realistic. And she obviously knew for me to get out of the sport and do professional events would be a lifesaver. And she was mm. right. Mm. You know, that's why I think with her younger teams that she has now, obviously younger, younger Horn did not compete at the Olympics. She will obviously, we're going to continue. But with the ones that competed at the Olympics, I think she would say, yeah, let's do it. Let's continue. Let's take one year at a time and get you there and see what happens. Though, you know, in a way, what I don't want to happen, and we always we always know there's a chance, um, let's say you have one pair team number one, pair team number two by results. And pair team number two says, well, we want to work with someone else. Because now they have options. Mm. They have Nina Moser is back and Tudberidze is available as a pair coach. And I'm thinking to myself, what if they say, nah, you know, she pays more attention to these guys. Well, jealousy is normal. I was jealous to Mishko Tonek and Dmitriev, and I thought that we deserve more attention. But everything happens for a reason. And Tamara made a very good point in her little interview on Russian podcast. She said, you compete as you practice, which we all know. And she says, the skaters who practice stronger, they will get ahead. So which means sometimes it's not the coach. Well, we know it's sometimes, most of the times, it's not the coaches, the skaters. They either didn't finish what they were supposed to, or they didn't do what she told them, didn't listen, thought they knew better. We don't know all the details under the cover because, you know, my coach and her team's usually very well-behaved and polite athletes. You hardly ever hear any explosion out of that team of coaches and skaters, and which Tamara's completely her accomplishment because that's what she teaches you sportsmanship no one needs to know your drama yes there's always drama but the world does not need to know we as a team can talk about it we contain it and we move on either this way or that way but there's no need to bring all that stuff out so then you're your center of attention not in a good way because i think and i agree with her completely good news is great but if you have bad behavior, bad news, and you just want the whole world to know, eh, there's no need for it. You know, that's why I'm so disappointed with some events that took place, not just the Olympics, that? but yeah. the previous Olympics, you know. It's, it's just, uh, I'm talking not- about the ladies event, you were talking about behavior. I'm just wondering, and I, I haven't heard a clear answer, so I didn't know if you would know from an athlete perspective. Could anyone have pulled Sasha Trusova backstage so that she could have had that moment in private. In private, yeah. Because I think that her reaction was real and it was what it was, but now it's captured on video for the rest of her life. Yes, and that's the worst part because you, when you do this, you're so involved with your emotions and you don't think, oh my God, this is what people are gonna, 20 years from now when she is coaching and she's a mother of her children, you know, they will watch this and they're like, <sighs> What did you, what were you thinking? And, you know, it's hard to say. She's a star, no doubt about it. And I think for her coaches to tell her, go there and pitch your feet there was difficult because you got to be careful with your stars. And it's, it's a known fact, you know, you, you can't just yell at them and say, go hide. Plus the setup was like, she, she was trying to hide, but there yeah. was nowhere to hide. You're, you're, you're there. She tried to go behind the curtain. She tried to... But in a way, she was so upset, I think she stopped thinking about it. It was her yeah. pure, raw emotions coming out. Lost control, which, yes, she's immature, young, get it. But again, it's just it was so sad to see. And I swear to God, when Anna Sherbakova skated and Sasha saw that, she already knew that she's not going to be second, obviously, because Anna placed higher. You know, she knew that the first place was probably out of reach because at that point, we all, I thought, that Camila just going to get out there, do her thing, and be first. Of course, things didn't work out that way, plus all the doping thing. He, he just don't know. But I think Sasha got upset right away when she saw Anna Sherbakova getting ahead of her. And because she was upset with the whole thing, I landed five quads, and she was just blinded by that. 
I landed five quads. I deserve to win, like Nathan Chen. Well, Nathan Chen's quads were perfect, and everything else was perfect. There was not even one mistake, I believe, in his long program. Of course, he deserved to win and be the most fabulous skater in the world. But if you calm down and step back and really look at the bigger picture, five quads, amazing. She is amazing. I have lots of respect for her as a goal-oriented. I'll go to my target. I will accomplish my goals no matter what. I have blinds on my eyes, and I'm going to go straight to that point. But at the same time, three quads were gorgeous. Two questionable. One slightly under, one step out, double axle, triple toe, two foot. I mean, seriously, she was just not capable of seeing any of that at the moment. And that's why she was so upset because for her, well, Sherbakova did two quads and that's it. How come? How is it possible? But when I watched Anna, I cried. Again, I, I get emotional when I watch those beautiful girls. And Anna looked to me very balanced, well-balanced overall, beautiful, extremely sweet person. I, you can tell by just the behavior overall, always, always quiet, never says much, does the work, works like nobody else, super strong mentally, unbelievably powerful person inside and out. And to me, I was not surprised when I saw the marks. Plus, okay, let's talk about it some more. Triple axel in the short. As a fact, it was not consistent in practice. But she says, I want to do it. Wonderful. Again, applause, applause, applause. She is an incredible athlete. Yes. But things could have been completely different if she landed a perfect double axel with arms overhead. And she wouldn't have lost those points and she could have been gold medalist, most likely under the given circumstances, right? Right. So when she got upset, at that point, she just was so disappointed that how many more years can I do this? I finally landed my five quads. And that's what she said at the press conference. I landed my five quads. This is what I always thought. I land five quads, I'll win. But it didn't happen. And of course, she was upset. She was bitter. And I mean, yes, I get it. She lost it. And it's hard to be positive about what happened, though I do understand all that drama. However, yes, it would be a lot better if she was taken somewhere to cry and fix the makeup and stop saying things to other people who did not deserve that outburst. Because to me, yes, maybe she was upset with the coaches for whatever reason it was. Probably, I don't even know why, because apparently the coaches were more reasonable with the content because they understand it's it's your components, it's your spins, it's your skating skills, it's your ability to skate to your music, not just crossover, crossover, jump, crossover, crossover, jump. We, they see bigger picture. But I think in a way they wanted Sasha to accomplish what she wanted to accomplish and they allow her to you know, follow her dreams it, versus other girls where maybe the content wasn't as difficult, but they had more overall put together routines. And Sasha was even upset with officials. And that is just, that was difficult for me to watch because you speak Russian. These people in China, they speak English. They don't understand what's going on. And her outburst towards the officials and the coaches and Gorshkov himself, the president of Federation Russian, you know, all that kind of was a little bit upsetting for me because you do know better. You represent your country. It's not like you're there by yourself, for yourself. You, the whole country is behind you. And you know, Russia is a huge country and we, we demand respect and we give respect. I think Russian athletes are always respectful towards others and it's nice to see sportsmanship and the whole atmosphere after that meltdown the whole thing when they got their little pandas, everything looked like there was a lot of tension. And poor Japanese girl who deserved everything at that point, she got third. She was standing there thinking, what do I do? What's going yeah, on? Yeah, she was trying to be quiet you know, about her celebration. Yeah. What do I do? I want to congratulate Anna. I don't know if I can. I want to congratulate Sasha, but I can't. You know, it's like the whole experience for all three well Camilla of course out of the question different story but for all three it was a disaster and Anna Sherbakova who just won the Olympic medal 
she was sitting there like a little lost puppy, not knowing what to do. What do I do? What do I go? I'm afraid. I'm scared. I don't know. And what came to my mind at that point, when Eliza Chuk won, if you remember, when they were all standing there in the lobby somewhere, and he realized he was the gold medalist. Do you remember how many people were around him, yes. jumping and screaming and crying? And that is like an amazing feeling that all the people that helped you to get there, or they were there to support you, they were there. And Anna, by under circumstances, got deprived of that because it was a moment. I mean, the poor girl did everything she could in a number of years to prove that I am capable. I can do this. Sick or healthy doesn't matter. And she had ups and downs. She had downs. I mean, beyond understand downs. I mean, she messed up some competitions, but overall, she pulled it together for the Olympics. She did what she could and she did the best way possible. And she was just there alone. It's like it took away from her success in a way or her pleasure of, yes, this is the biggest accomplishment of, of my life. You know, and that's even when Dennis and I got silver medals, we had army of people right outside of the locker room for us, for Mishko Tionik and Dmitriev. The second we stepped out, it was all the Russians and all the officials, maybe with COVID is different, I don't know. But people were just there mm. screaming and crying with us and going, this is amazing. And it makes you feel even better for what they say compared to what you just did. Because mm. up until that moment, you don't really realize, oh, well, yeah, it's great, it's wonderful. But then you know your country is behind you, your people are behind you. It adds to your experience. And I think just the whole, I couldn't believe my eyes. What happened, it was early in the morning. I was at work. Every coach had the phone on the board. <laughs> so we kind of were speaking, you know? And I was like, well, what's going on? I watched and I didn't see all the developing drama because I had to turn my phone off and go home. So I got home. I sat down, turned my big screen TV on. And I was like, okay, I'm going to watch. And I watched at the rink. I watched the peacock without the commentating. So, you know, you don't know what's going on. At home, Tara and Johnny, and you know, they were there. Tara, they mean they all were there. And I was like, is this a joke? At first, mm. I could hear Sasha screaming, even I swear to God, even when Camilla was sitting there and crying her eyes out, you could hear something going on. And I was like, is this a joke? What's going on there? And then next thing you know, there's Camilla and there's Sasha behind. And I still couldn't understand what was going on, though I could hear the words in Russian. I knew exactly what was unraveling, but I couldn't believe my eyes that actually the cameras were trying to capture all that. You would think in Russia it would be like, done. let's do something else. Let's not keep attention on this drama. But I think at the Olympics, when you go there, you have to accept the fact that you're on the microscope 24-7. I remember they follow you. You want to warm up, you hide someone, they still find you. They, that's what they want. They want to see you raw when you stress, yeah. when you're happy, when you're upset. And that's just, that's what makes it so crazy special. You know, this is the event when you're followed around all the time. And I'm sure NBC, ABC, whatever companies, they're allowed to do it. So when you go there, you should be prepared that you're watched. And every little thing you give them, mostly negative positive is good because it's you know it's great it's wonderful we love you for that but negative experience and all those emotional explosions they will be discussed for many many years to come and there are tons of examples you know these days 20 years ago 10 years ago 15 years ago people still talk about what happened then not so much about good and positive things but about who said what and who did what and how bad it was and that's how it is we have tendency to remember something that is not so attractive. It's just the way things work. It's it's something out of ordinary that people will discuss for many years to come. And I have videos of Nancy of Kerrigan you know, on the channel, her biography, and people write nasty comments based on something that she said every, it, it happens yeah. like almost every day. Someone will write, yeah. it's, it's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was then, wondering- yeah versus uh, Gita was same thing, what Medvedeva said, and right. it, it follows you around, and all this negativity and ugliness will stay with you for the rest of your life. Tanya Harding, Nancy Kerrigan, people will never forget. It's, it's there. 
it's on videos, it's on social media. You can't get away from it. That's why you have to be super careful when you, it's such a huge world stage. Mature, immature doesn't matter. You have to be careful. Though, again, like I said, I do understand her disappointment. I get it. But when you take a step back and you really, and a lot of people like on Russian stations now, they go into details and they break it down and they tell other people who are for Sasha, they say that Anna did not deserve this. And they're like, no, take a step back, take a look. This is what took place. This is how Anna ended up with losing just a few points to Sasha in the long because she was clean and a lot more. I mean, she was nearly perfect as with what she did. And when you look at Sasha's yellow box, yellow box, red, it, they were things that didn't allow her to score 10 points over Anna. Because if this was the case, she would still have won. If she had a little bit more head. And of course, the short program probably was the beginning of that drama, you know. Yeah. I mean, a lot of coaches with knowledge of figure skating will tell you the same thing. You don't put difficult, super difficult element if it's not at least 90 plus percent consistent it's a lot of stress it's a lot of pressure and yes it is olympics it's hard to put that thing in like i tell you when dennis and i competed and my coach said okay if triple toe loop is not face down no double axel and i was like thank you because all i could think of i want to do my best on the triple toe it was not perfect it was two footed but as scott hamilton said Elena should be super happy about it and i was <laughs> i was more happy about I did not have to do that double axle. And even today, believe it or not, people come to the rink, people that I coach, and they tell me, well, why didn't you do double axle? As I said, because chances of me landing that double axle were not 100% because I was terrified of that jump. And what if I fell on it? We would be behind mm -hmm. Brazil and Eisler. At that point, we had to skate clean, not knowing what they were going to produce. And obviously, we made the right decision. And then people say to us, well, if you landed double axel, you would have beat Mishkutyona Kadimitri. Well, not necessarily. No, because they made mistakes, but they were still so spectacular. And they already world champions. And we were, we were dark horses when we came in. We were not even one, two, and three. We were like fourth, maybe. So, you know, for us to listen to Tamara and do what she says, that was the biggest thing that, you know, the best thing that we could possibly do. You know, and that's when trusting your coach comes to play. Yeah. And it has to be, you know. Would you I'm curious. Oh, sorry, okay. Dave, go ahead. No, because I was about to ask a technical question. <laughs> oh. Well, I was going to go to the other pair. So ask the technical. Oh, okay. So my question, we've seen a lot of issues in this particular um, discipline with some of the jumps or the, the throws rather. And some of the throws, it seems almost like the women are getting too much height. Like we saw what well, we saw an issue with um, the yeah. Canadian pair with Kirsten Moore Towers mm -hmm. in the short where he threw and fell forward. But we've seen a yeah. lot of, yeah. of the yeah. pairs have to land on two yeah. feet because there's so much height. Could you talk us a little bit about when you're going into a throw like do you like a lot of height? Do you not like a lot of height? Or what were we sort of seeing with a lot of these girls having to two foot out of big, big throws? Well, Dennis and I had decent amount of height and it was always consistent. We never tried, if we were trying to go this high, we would never try to go higher because your okay. timing will change. If you rotate your certain rotation position, you're tight in the air and you're this much higher, you land and your body doesn't know what to do. So of course it has to be consistent. You learn to go higher and you stick with it because if you learn to go this high and then you go low, same issue, you're not gonna land because your body will not know how to react to it. But yes, I noticed that let's say some Chinese, they, they fly high, but they, that's what they do. They train to do that. But mm. also some girls look like it's super high and maybe on adrenaline, it's higher than usual. Got and that's it. when you're like, whoa, the gravity gets you because your leg is not used to that impact. And I think like, for example, Ashley Kane, beautiful throw, beautiful. And she landed a little bit too low and put her foot down. And I was like, why? It was such a gorgeous throw jump, you know? And who knows, maybe it was too high, maybe it was too low. 
That's why it's so important to learn a certain way and stay with it. But I mm. always notice that Chinese couples, their teams, they have higher throat. But that's mm. what they do. That's what they work on. I think our previous Olympics, there was a very, I don't remember their names, but there was a tiny, tiny, thin girl. She would fly. That's the one who fell one time trying to quad talk out and fell on her knees mm. and they stopped the routine in that. Her throws were like, how can you land that high on such thin leg? It's got to be something, either training or, I don't know, or technique. I've, I've read some documentary on Chinese coaching, pair coaching, Chinese like technique uh, from previous generation coach who was older, who has been around forever. He actually, in a way, invented different ways of doing throws. He had some sort of formula how to get higher, how to rotate, and how to land. And I think Chinese couples, they still use that formula. It's like a physical approach, like physics approach almost. Almost like we have to give you this much force, this much elevation for you to land. So, you know, and their throws most of the times are perfect. It's like the flow out is amazing. Uh, the, uh, the Russian teams, I think all of them in a way had a little bit of... <laughs> on the landing. All of them mm -hmm. had a little bit of a slow down. And what makes a throw jump special, it's the flow on the landing. And that is like unbelievable success with that specific element. And mm -hmm. I think in the long run, again, skaters will, the pair skaters will work on height and learn how to deal with it. Because when you're higher, you check out a little bit earlier because you know you have that, like opening a parachute a little bit sooner so you can touch down smooth. Right. And I think, again, it's a it's a matter of discovering how working on it and making it 100 percent consistent every single time. But of course, throw jumps look impressive when they're way high because that's what mm -hmm. makes it so special, you know, and the higher you are, the easier landing should be, because realistically, you have time to check out, you have time to touch down smoother. Instead mm. of if it's lower and you really have to force it because the landing, the gravity, the concrete is about to get you. So mm. that's just my opinion on this. Well, what did you make of Alexa and Brandon? Um, I, you know, Alexa has had, if you think about it, she's done eight programs at the Olympics. They did both uh, team events four years ago. They did the two longs. It was the shakier Olympics. This time she did yeah. three good programs out of four. Um, mm. And it seemed like she really hit a personal best. I think you could tell in the free program, as soon as I saw her put her fingers over the ice, I said, okay, I think she is done. I think she is ready. She has achieved her personal goal. You know, what did you well, make of it? Yeah, I think they were amazing. I think they were absolutely the best I've ever seen her personally and them together. Of course, it was the performance of their lives, except one little bubble on the South Cal. And honestly, even if he did a triple, maybe they could have been fifth because I still thought they were amazing and their communication with each other, the music, and they looked fabulous. Chinese looked great, but they were just a little bit more mechanic. Plus, they also made a mistake on the jump. So there was like, Ify, who's going to get what? Who's going to get ahead? In a way, I don't know. She, uh, Alexa is wonderful and beautiful, but she's had such a long career. I personally do not see them going for four more years. Because, you know, she's married. She loves her husband. They have such a wonderful relationship. I think logically it makes sense for them to just, okay, we did this. Let's do a couple of years of Stars on Ice, maybe. Uh, be, show people how wonderful we are. And just, you know, hang it. We have a family and move on. But again, I don't know. But to me, it looked like it was her best ever and it's hard to beat that that's the point mm. you know staying after such great performance and trying it again there's no guarantee you're gonna do it again and i think she should be super satisfied super happy with her commitment because her commitment was crazy i did it with dennis we did i had a career with someone else nine years of skating together and then i switched to dennis and it was a huge commitment different because alexa has a family she's got a husband and the whole team gave her that go do it we believe in you you can do this it was amazing it was really brave and wonderful and amazing like all i can say i have lots of respect for the whole team for jenny and todd actually supporting them and telling them yes we're gonna do this and 
look how wonderfully it worked out. Olympics, your biggest event of your life at this point with this new partner. And both of them pulled it together and they were amazing. I think we are right. When she did that, it was like, okay, I'm done. I just want to touch the ice and this is it. The feeling that she's taken home from all this should be, oh my God, I did it all. I'm done. I'm happy. What else can I ask for? And, you know, maybe they will go to world championships. Who knows? Because the United States at this point does not have strong pair teams to go to the worlds and, you know, because these two pair teams are the best. And I've heard some rumors that the third pair team broke up and there's no, it's not that much to pull from in American pair teams, unfortunately. I just think they're lacking that. Depth, yeah. This is the problem with pair teams in, in America. We're going to be Terry Lipinski and Brian Baitana for a very long time. And once it doesn't work out, we'll see if we can do pairs. In Russia, it doesn't happen. In Russia, you they grow you as a pair skater. At the age of 12, 13, 14, you have a partner, if you're lucky, and you do it for years to come. You grow together as a pair team. And if you look at the results, basically, the pair teams are mostly successful the pair teams will stay together for more than two or three years. It's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, your entire life, basically. That's how you know each other. That's how you have that volume of training together you can rely on. Because two, three years is a joke. You just beginning to feel each other. You're beginning to trust each other. Because it's really important to know your partner. It's like married couples. You're married for 25 years. Excellent, because you don't have to talk, you know what you think. And same mm. goes to skating. It's years together, it's miles and miles of work together, miles and miles of tears and sweat and anger and happiness together. And that's what makes you so special and successful. You know, and Alexa and Brandon, they've done an amazing job within last just what two years, three years, because uh, I was at nationals in Greensboro, 20th, 2020. And she was still with her husband. And then next thing you know, within a month, there's this rumors and news. Like, there's no way. Yes way. And it was the right decision <laughs> to make. It was a yeah. huge topic of discussion at the rink where I work. How is this going to work? She's married. How is this going to? And everybody agreed that her relationship is so strong. Her marriage is so strong. It's not going to change anything. She's just skating with a partner. There's, I mean, it's athletic decision. It's a decision within a team. And her husband is involved and he's given her full go, go girl, you can do this. And I think it's amazing. And I think it's the relationship as a married couple is stronger because he gave her the trust. You got this, go do it. And then you're done. You come back and we will continue our own path because I think they have their own path as a couple and they even can ski together if they want to start stars on nice shows and stuff as if he is really interested you know they have a whole bunch of options for them at this point but i think i agree with you that she should be super excited for what happened because how many athletes can say i went to the olympics i did my best at the right time well, you know mm. this many but also there were some who said i blew it this was not my night which is really sad because you're supposed to have your best at that point so well, as we wrap things up, what do you think of the Japanese pair? I thought that they really have proven themselves as the team of the future over the last year. They've love continued them. to build every competition. Love them. Love them. I love everything about them. They're just so pure. They smile. It's like it's, it comes natural. It's not coached, not staged. They're just happy. And the girl is just so petite and so beautiful and just so wonderful like an angel and i love the technical elements the lift the the trademark lift he must be like um rambo you know in a way <laughs> to sit down to, lift the girl, to do all this to go back down have all that control and she is not 50 pounds she's a normal size short kind of typical pair skater with muscle on her it, 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 she should be super strong to give them that ability to do it because as a girl, I know you have to be super strong. You cannot be wobbly on any Ella Pears elements. You have to be a rock when it comes to lifts and stuff. And I think they're wonderful. I really love them. And I think if we lose a couple of pair teams from the top, they will be huge contenders for next couple of years with 
their creativity, with their different way of seeing pair skating, because honestly, they're like breath of fresh air. And I think I said it before, I just I love their short program. It was maybe not the music, that, that nothing new really, but just the way they inter interpreted it, the elements, the transitions, and it's just everything they need. They have everything they need to become successful. But you know, the only thing that really surprised me, their height difference, they are kind of smaller than your typical Russian approach, tall guy, a little bit shorter girl. But if you look at three Russian pair teams now, the girls are not 4'11", they are 5'2", 5'3", 5'4". So the girls are becoming more and more kind of, you know, normal size and average, I would say. And Tarasova and all the two other girls, they all pretty much the same height. And the guys are tall and they manage just fine. So I wouldn't say there's a huge difference like Katya and Sergei, or well, Katya was so tiny and Sergei was really strong. That is gone. It's like a mm. different approach these days and proves the point you can be more proportioned and still do magic on the ice. It's all about strength, communication, working together and your technical content. Your, your elements have to be absolutely physically executed correctly to still be successful and do all those fancy stuff that pairs do. And proves the point that um, smaller overall pair teams can still be successful. Look at Chinese Olympic champions. They are small. There's this much difference between the two of them. They look like they're the same size. The guy acts like she's five pounds heavy. He manipulates her and they do everything so take the foundation that makes it successful. Of course, it helps you have a smaller girl, but look at Ashley and Timothy. They're too, she's tall, but still their technical content is amazing. Their lifts outstanding because the technique, the way you get the girl up there, the way you hold your arm, the way you use your um, physics versus all oh, muscles of my back, I'm going to get her up there no matter what. And that's what makes it all possible with more, so to speak, more proportioned pair teams these days. You know, that's even Dennis and I, Mishkutonik and Dmitry were more proportioned, more, I mean, yeah, we were like, there was no such wow difference. Isabel and Lloyd had very petite Isabel, but again, she was not really tiny. She was pretty much, you know, 5'1", typical pair skating standard. And he was six feet tall. He just looked massive because he was built different. But I think these days, those days when the girl is tiny, tiny and the guy is super strong, those days are gone. More mm. and more and more, you see more standard uh, proportion between the partners and still doing amazing things. So, well, what was your, both of your moments of the pair event uh, for each of you? How about you, Jonathan? Well, I have to say, you know, I was there, this was a win win. Any of these four pair teams that were going to to come out ahead i was happy to get behind because they all have great things behind them i personally just happen to like the choreographic material of the chinese pair the best so when they had the issue on the sow cow i got really nervous as a viewer and i don't like i normally like elena was saying i like to check the results and then like watch when i can handle it emotionally but to watch it in real time it was really nerve-wracking so for them to turn around and then do the clean throw right afterwards yeah. told me, oh, they're not going to let it get in their way. Yeah. They're going to sell it. So I think it's the the landing of the throw right after the mistake on the sow that sort of made my heart sing a little bit. Yeah, oh, same here. Flawlessly, flawless performance after that mistake. Flawless. Like even stronger than you would think, even if she landed triple sow, she felt like I got to give it all. That's it. This is my chance. But my strongest point was that I still think Russians look good and I'm happy for everybody. I'm happy that things ended up beautifully. There was sportsmanship. My coach, as a matter of fact, congratulated everyone. And I got tons of messages from my friends. She's so tiny because she is, you know, and I think she's getting smaller because, you know, my mom, I watched my mom. She's like, what happened to that tall woman? I used to think she used to be now. She's really small. And I think with age, we just have tendency to get smaller, but her respect for others, her respect for other athletes, you could clearly see she went to congratulate everyone and her athletes behaved well. Nobody had any meltdowns. It was a great 
powerful, really competitive event. And that's what makes it so special at the Olympics. You watch and you think this is fair, you know, this is the way it should be. This is what Olympics are all about. Fairness and power and different styles because every team was basically a different style. They had a strength, weaknesses. It was not all the same. It was not, though we said that was slow music for the most part, it still looked like every pair was different. And that's the thing mm. that's, that was so amazing for me to see the difference. I have to admit, I started watching when I woke up the nerve to watch the strongest, you know, I watched the last warm up. Then I went back and I watched everything. I have to say, there were some pair teams who look like, how could they get at the Olympics? How could they mess up so much? Because I never really thought that going to the Olympics, you can not lift to lift, or you can just stop fighting and there were some pairs that i was like oh yeah yeah this is the olympics what are you thinking and of course yeah. it was such a huge change from first two warm-ups to strong warm-ups and i was like right. yes all right now we can sit back and enjoy watch real yeah. athletic events mm -hmm. yeah that was a shocker for me because i was like how and i told my husband because i forced him to watch everything he's like okay all right this is not soccer tournament but i'm gonna watch <laughs> this with my wife and i Tula, give me your opinion because you know he he watches skating olympics he watches all the time and he was like well this is what i think they were great but this was better this was amazing and this didn't look right so he he was on top of this with me and he said well yeah some of those performances were like <gasps> you know really scary yeah it, it, some of the elements like a lift wouldn't go up or canadian period team throw was like <gasps> my husband went ah it's like, oh, yeah, this doesn't happen often. I right. think one of the things happened at nationals or something like, or one of those qualifying events I went with my student, one of the teams had similar issue, but the girl went down flat right away. It was awful to see. And usually falls like this do not happen. This is like one in a million. And unfortunately it happens at the most important event. And it's just, you blame yourself for probably for a very long time. Mm. How could it happen? you know no, but that, no. that's what makes competition so unique that ice is slippery you never know what your blade is gonna do <laughs> some like yuzuru hanyu who thought he was gonna pop a quadruple falco he can do in his sleep in the short right. program so that was like how could this happen it feels and a million years ago that that happened it feels like our lives have changed so much <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, I have to say the moment uh, for me, I think was seeing everyone do well. I also have to say the Georgian pair I thought was really strong here. So it was really yeah, it was just a nice. great event. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Definitely nice performance from them and nice debut because that, I think that was a first event in such a big world field, you know, and they did not look shaky. They look, would do it, you know, mm -hmm. which was good to see. And again, it's training, 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 training discipline structure day after day week after week month after month the goal is there everything else should not matter don't look at others do your job do your thing do everything you're told because people you work with you trust them and they will get you there you know it well in most cases of course so. great advice thank you so yeah. much Jaleda. you're welcome all of you know, hold the edge and look sexy all right bye. yeah thank you bye well, we wanted to come back for a little bit of a postscript. We did this at Worlds last year. I feel like we've talked so much and um, I'll just start and I'll let you go. I'm just, I've been planning my next As the Blade Turns for a couple of days and I decided to take a couple of days because in the immediate aftermath, I think everyone's emotions were so raw after the ladies short program, uh, ladies free program, sorry. I women's, sorry, <laughs> habit. Uh, I didn't know if I felt emotional, if I felt dramatic, if I, or if I was feeling clear headed and I wanted to take time to really reflect on it before I said anything um, too strongly one way or another. So I'm glad that we are doing this now uh, and there will be more as the blade turns about this situation and I'm going to be continuing to cover it. Um, but I don't know what you feel. I'm really glad in one way that the pairs happened because it felt like a little bit of moving forward and a little Ooh. bit of a palate cleanser. But at the same time, I think that this, the same issues still persist. Um, although I 
I felt watching the pairs that I still love to watch skating. So I yes. still love the art of skating and it made me want to go skate. But I do think that what happened in the women's event, I feel like has been building for 10 years, um, at least 12 years. Um, and some could say, you know, for decades longer, but I think a real concentration of what's been happening over the last several years um, with Instagram culture, with the code of points, with abuse, with, uh, you know, certain people in the sport. Um, and I felt like it was like a bomb went off that was waiting to happen. At least that's how I've been feeling and I've felt shell shocked. So I don't know what is your take on the last. Yeah, again, as we've discussed, when people come out of the woodwork in our lives that know how much we are involved with skating and things like that, as I'm sure many people watching, they become the expert for their family and their friends and all these things. Everyone reaching out is sort of like, you watch this? This is, this is what you love so much? Like watching all of these meltdowns with young children on, and it's sort of, it isn't a good look for the sport at all. But of course, those of us that have been following it very closely know that it was almost inevitable that at some point it was going to burst, uh, this sort of tension. And <clears throat> again, I, I was sort of like, oh, the pairs are finishing the event. And in a way, thank God they did. Uh, I, I think that like you, I needed to be reminded of the sport I love so much. And the really all of these pairs in the top 10, especially were giving us lovely moments, comebacks, personal stories, you know, fun programs at times. And I, I just needed it to end on a note that wasn't so dark, heavy and confusing because I think a lot of us are like, what happens next? You know, like you said, when we were talking about the men's event, it feels like a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. that, or even the team event. It's, so there, there were such great moments in actually each discipline, but really three podiums that also I was very excited by here. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know, there was so much positive at this Olympics, but of course, it's so heavy what's lingering over it. And of course, I, I'm, af I'm afraid it's only just begun, whatever. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, do we believe something will change? Do we believe nothing will change? Either way, I, I think it gets uglier before it gets better. I, I do think so. Um, I've started to read the, um, the Russian side of things. And obviously I have a lot of people in my life who represent the other point of view, um, even at the ice rink. Um, so there's a lot of different discussions and, and conversations. Um, one thing I will say is that over the years, I've gotten a lot of messages. Why were you focusing on a Terry so much? Why? And I have to say that it was a journalistic instinct and it's something that I think, um, I don't think that she has, I don't think she has some magic potion, right? I, I think that what a Terry has is a system and more aggressive in every area. And a lot of those areas are dark areas. Um, and, yeah. I, and I do think that, and at least in Western culture, very dark. <clears throat> What's acceptable other ways in the world is something that I think the sport is really grappling with. Um, one thing that I'll say is that I thought about myself as a little kid. Um, and I thought about my VHS tapes of the 92 and the 94 Olympics that I would be like, you know, I used to, you know, before the internet, before YouTube, everyone who's watching this, we used to have a TV guide, okay? And it would come in the newspaper once a week and you would look and you knew if skating was gonna be on, it was gonna be like Saturday afternoon. And the first things I would do is I would look at like channel two, channel four, channel seven. Then I would look at ESPN. I would look at- ESPN two, yeah. <laughs> when that became a thing, right? To look at when the skating was gonna be on. This is when I'm like a nine year old or an eight year old. And that's how I'd like then beg my parents, will you buy me more VHS tapes? And they'd be like, can't you tape over something? I'd be like, well, do you have an old tape I can use? Yeah, right? And, and I was thinking about how much I watched those 94 Olympics and the ladies event, right? And, and we talked a little bit with Yelena about how Nancy was um, really berated for uh, you know, making the snarky comment. She's forever labeled negatively uh, for that. I cannot imagine kids re-watching what we saw at the end of the women's competition, full stop. I, I think about myself in that age, and I think that that's something that my parents might not allow that mm. that's different 
Like that, we have, yes, there have been eating disorders in the sport. There has been, a, what we saw was so concentrated and at such a level to get to that kind of a trauma response. Um, from, from several people, that was not one person's people. trauma response, sure. but several, yeah. I think for me, um, I was triggered by a couple of things there. I was triggered by where were the adults in the room? Now we have seen a video that Danielle Gleikenhaus actually did um, congratulate Anna Shermakova, but she was left alone. Gorshkov is with Trusova and then Dudikov, who has always been said to be the kindest of that coaching staff was with her. A volunteer was with Camila. Where, where were Terry and Daniil for a lot of this that was going on? And when we did see their body language, it wasn't, it wasn't in a genuine fashion. Even when a Terry congratulated Anna, she joked, you know, why didn't you do the quad? But there was like a distance there. There was like an interpersonal distance. Um, I, I think that the way that a Terry talked to, um, you know, even Trusova, Trusova obviously didn't want anything to do with her, but we did um, see that. It was very, very, um, it was triggering. I don't know, I, I just, I felt that she was so alone. And, and Dave, whatever someone's trigger could be, it mm -hmm. was present in some aspect of that of that lady's free skate and the aftermath afterwards. Whether you identify with Kauri as the one doing all the right things, but you don't have a chance, or you're the Anna left alone and you have to shrink your accomplishment. Whether you're the Trusova and feel betrayed that you were told if you do this, you get this, and you did that according you know, to what they said, and you're not getting that. Or you're, I can't imagine the pressure of, well, there, there was something for everyone there to just be so upset by because I think everyone that watched that footage experienced a trigger and they all came from different places. It, it's just something clearly needs to be looked at. One of the big debates that I've seen um, is over Terry's comments to Camila when she got off the ice. And I just wanna like put this into perspective because I have maybe the smallest insight into this, but that is how my coach speaks to me. When I, even in practice or, right with the errors and sometimes i really don't like it but it, it's also you know, knowing you're a grown man right correct correct yeah. correct yeah. i'm just saying it, it's i don't always like it but it is a cultural thing however i believe that the situation changed when now there is someone who is a symbol and it's morphed into nationalism into propaganda into conversations about Dominic. camilla represented so many things by the end of the game and there was so much noise and she was obviously aware of it right and that you could tell by what the volunteer was saying to her, you know, the whole world was against you and you did this and that. I do think in that moment, her coaches didn't seem that human with her. They were still yeah. talking about this just in terms of the performance. And yes, it's their job to get her to perform that well. And it was over. Everything out. It was over. Not a warm up. Ever. Yeah. I don't know if we're ever going to actually see her skate again. I don't mm. know. I think it's up in the air. It could go a myriad of ways. We could see her at the world championships. She could be banned from the world championships. What I, she's supposed to get like the highest honor um, that can be given um, by the government. It could go a myriad of ways. Um, and I think there will be continued, unfortunately for her, I don't think that her participation in competitions in the immediate future is going to be well received. Um, well, and it's interesting if the narrative that we happen to know is being pushed is that the evil media did this to Camila as if they were responsible for the positive drug test. Uh, but then you would think that that was a moment for a Terry to, to play up that narrative even more. Mm -hmm. Let me comfort you because that performance was not your fault. That performance was the media's fault. But it, that was not the message they chose to send. I think that, that she and her team are shell-shocked. I think they really felt invincible. Mm -hmm. and, and I would imagine this has totally surprised them. And they're struggling with understanding how to navigate out of this. I, I think that you can see in the Russian press a mixed reaction and then they're calling them heroes but there's some stuff how will Trusova be received because she was right. maybe disrespectful to adults and in that way I it, I've always felt that a Terry Tuberidza had that certain quality as a coach that was like Karoli level but maybe even more 
Mm-hmm. And I think now we're seeing yes, right? Like this is, she is that kind of a figure. And I don't think it's the kind of figure that maybe they really wanted to be, you know, right. and maybe they didn't care or have the awareness of it, but she's made her dent on the sport and <laughs> she pushed it. I think we talked about her pushing as far as she can go. And I think in certain areas, she pushed it way too hard. And to, there are going to be changes, I believe, that will be made. I hope will be made. Um, because I, I do think that the future of the sport, unfortunately, even though this was the most interesting event to cover, right, in, in the last couple of weeks, I don't think it's necessarily good for the sport. They say, you know, all press is good press. I don't think that this is good press in terms of getting people to sign up to join figure skating in, in a country where it's expensive, right? I yeah. don't think that that's necessarily a positive thing to know that maybe every athlete from certain countries are doping and you don't have a fair shot. Right. Or what this all means. I think that that's, I mean, it's hard to know because gymnastics has still obviously continued after um, the scandals that they have had. So you can look at, you know, gymnastics has fallen off so- But isn't soon. it almost too soon to tell if it's yes. really survived that scandal? We wouldn't yeah. know until about 10 to 12 years what will really happen. Yeah. So, um, and, and I'm curious. I, I think that the age range, the age limit will absolutely be raised. I think that that's a question. I think that whether it goes up to 17 and they go to 16 next year and 17 the year after that, whatever they do, um, I, I just, I, I think that that's cosmetic. Um, and I think there, there are more structural changes, but I don't, I don't have confidence in the ISU pushing those changes because the ISU is so infiltrated by the Russians. Lukernik is the highest ranking official in, in figure skating in the ISU. So uh, for me- And with the president retiring, Right, yeah. like I think it could be very telling and I bet a lot of people are going to be very strategic in who is being nominated and voted in this spring. Yeah, um, I have to say for, um, yeah, I'm reading a book right now, The Rush Affair um, about sports, which is about the whistleblowers in the doping case uh, from track and field. Um, and from 2015, it's it puts a lot of this into perspective, into a bigger perspective. And I just don't think that there's any incentive. Um, I don't I don't think that c- calling Russia the, the Russian Olympic Committee has done anything, has done anything. And that's one of the big conversations that that originally people have had with me is, you know, but aren't they on probation? Don't they care? Why would they do this? How could this happen? Is this a mistake? And I just uh, uh, reading that book, that book's perspective is that this is cultural and that Mm. this is ingrained in a view of sport where this is not viewed as cheating. Well, or where if like what Lance Armstrong's real Mm -hmm. defense was, was I so adamantly believe everyone else is doing it too. Mm -hmm. So if we don't do it, we're the ones being taken advantage of. So we have to do it. Mm -hmm. But it's- I mean, this runner in the Russian affair was, a small girl uh, from uh, or from a small t- a girl from a small town. There are people beating her in races, and it was like, "You want to get a better life for yourself? This is what you do. It's just what you do. Yeah. You don't ask." And 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 I think that that puts back to that you can't put the onus on the girls or, or the athletes in the system. Um, it's it, when it's from a system, it's from the top down. I think that what I hope that comes out of this is that WADA actually looks at the full depth of the system because we don't know that, right? What we don't know is how young does it start? How young, and I think that there are good parts about their organized system. I think that they're in more organized training at five, six, seven, eight, you know, in a way where a skater from North America is kind of navigating on their own and someone has a little talent and this happens and this happens and things start falling into place where Tessa and Scott come together, right? In Canada and they're brought up, but they weren't like designed to be together always. Right. And, you know, those things happen more accidentally. Um, I think that they will need to look at, you know, what age does doping start? That's, 
I think one of the big questions, and, and I think Paulina made a really great point about seeing 10 year olds doing, you know, quads and triple triples and how there are big red flags that I think that we've all bought into. And, and I think that we need to, I, there, just from seeing the reactions to people even on our videos and whatnot, we all wanna believe it, right? Like we've all wanted to believe that this young people can just be doing quads and doing triple triples and doing all of it. But when you look back, it's like, of course, we know what was happening, right? Like, of course, it's so blatantly obvious. It, but it was like, but, and everyone seeds their own power. And it's like, you, you can't, I think that focusing what the New York Times did on just the, the performance enhancers in competition is such a mistake because it's in the training. Yeah. You know, it's- and I, th I think they're used to that from like steroid stories or something about helping in a game be more powerful or helping in a race go faster. But like you said, it's the training that supposedly has all these secrets to unlocking these masterful things, but perhaps it was just, they found an ability to train longer than everyone else without the body needing to repair. 100%. My curious, what I think is the real story, and I've never really seen explored, is how did a Terry Two Breeds go from a nothing coach in the US, um, who didn't even get hired at certain ranks, to going to Russia, eventually teaming off with Sergei Dudikov, developing this technique of spinning the jumps with very light skaters develop, spinning the jumps, however that happened. And did it all happen with perfect timing with when uh, the 2010 Olympics didn't go well for Russia, so they wanted to put all this money into sport for the Sochi Olympics. And did this all happen kind of synergistically? Her rise, I think that there's still a lot that we don't know that a lot of the, I think a lot of the answers to a lot of the questions about what's happening um, is right. It's not all her, but she has been the biggest um, maneuver of the system. I She's think. the face of the system in a way. Yeah. And she wanted to be, it mm -hmm. seems. Yeah. Yeah. To the point that she's coaching pairs and coaching dance and has acted invincible, as you said. So, yeah. But I think there are also still, if you take away that event, the late, like, there were still great moments in, in men's and in dance. And, and that's unfortunate, isn't it? Like this was, you know, I've always been a huge fan of the French. I thought this dance thing was such a moment for them and for Hubble and Donahue to put together the clean program and get a medal, you know, great programs, great skates from everyone, great skates in the Paris event, some, some thrilling moments in the final group, wonderful skating in the men, a bunch of different kinds of programs and different skilled athletic artists, just thrilling overall. But unfortunately, it's all, it, in 94, somehow, we were still able to track the other stories alongside Tanya Nancy. Yes, if you say 94, we all know Tanya Nancy. But there was also interesting stuff happening in pairs there. There was, you know, uh, interest in how the dance event finished. And unfortunately, I think these Olympics are just eclipsed by this major, major news story, even though there were such amazing other moments to be had during it. Do you remember, I mean, when we started this three weeks ago, the biggest conversation was who had COVID? Did Danny G have COVID? How could he get on the plane? It is unbelievable how this yeah. story has twisted and turned. And it all feels connected. And it, uh, I'm almost at a loss for words in terms of still processing, you know, everything. Yeah. That happened, yeah. Um, Stunned. Right Stunned. Are. I'm very curious, will the FBI take action? Because if the FBI uh, investigates and brings up a Terry on charges, maybe the Russian Federation, uh, I think we would look at the assistant coaches, that could derail her coaching career because even though it's a 10 year imprisonment and million dollar fine, none of those things would ever happen. But what could happen is that they couldn't enter the US. If they can't enter the US for competition. What are you gonna do for those Russian athletes? All of a sudden they can't go to Skate America. All of a sudden they can't go to Skate Canada unless she hires other assistant coaches to bring them. I think how we, how we do testing has got to change. I think we're seeing and learning that, and we knew this, 
from cycling and things that WADA is not equipped to really detect a number of these drugs. And if clean sport is something serious, they have to change the way that they test. And there are big things there. Uh, and I think it depends. I think the credibility of the Olympics are at stake. I think that the ratings weren't great. And how they move forward, I think, are going to be the real questions because it's, it's a billion dollar industry. <laughs> because it had it had the weird vibe going in. It was never not going to be weird. It was weird because there are political things that play that uh, cannot help but sort of creep their way into this Olympics. In addition to the strangeness of COVID, COVID protocols, COVID affecting athletes eligibility, COVID having no audience, and then to now add this third element and that all of the figure skaters, many of them have been trapped there since before the team event. Like I feel it's been years that we've been watching this <laughs> Olympics. Yes. And I can't imagine those people in the weirdness with the scandal going on, with the COVID, you know, awkward moments, and to have been in that pressure cooker for that many weeks, I, I would imagine everyone's ready to go home and nap for hours and hours and hours. Well, I sure am. <laughs> I know, right? I'm drained and I didn't even do it, the skating, you know? I, I, I think everyone should be commending on making it out in one piece, really. And the fact that they even had the gala, I was watching some of the gala, um, performances that were highlighted on on peacock and things like that <clears throat> barely an audience by now also everyone's like going home and they're you know doing all of these things so again my my hats off to any competitor who was able to do a remote version of what they had hoped to do at this olympics i think it's pretty remarkable well we're going to keep covering it and there's plenty more to come even this season i think you know what it's just about, it's just getting started. I think, you know what, the, the interest of this, I think is just getting started. Whatever happens next, I don't know, but this will be very fascinating to watch. So hold an engine, look sexy. Bye guys.